Hey everyone, it's Third. Welcome to another episode of Boffer Basics, and today we're going to be talking about Chainmail. Chainmail is one of the most accessible forms of armor available uh, in Boffer. It tends to be relatively cheap compared to other forms of armor, the tools aren't specialized, and it's pretty easy to pick up. You don't need any special skills to, to make chain. Um, Chainmail primarily uh, comes in three types. You have riveted, butted mail, and uh, welded mail. Now for Boffer, we're going to be usually doing uh, what is called butted mail. So where the rings just come together and create a butt joint, the two ends of the rings right there, is called butted mail. Uh, welded mail would be where welds would be applied to that joint, and riveted mail would be where those would be flat edges with holes in them that would overlap and then be riveted closed. Um, while those are much more sturdy forms of mail, they're also very time consuming, they do require specialized materials and special skills, and they're more costly. For what we're doing, um, we don't need super durable chain mail. Uh, we're, not getting, we're not trying to defend ourselves against real weaponry. So for the purpose of boffer, butted mail will be just fine. Um, a chain mail uh, hauberk, or a full shirt, uh, typically weighs about 20 to 30 pounds, and it's going to incorporate somewhere between 15 and 40,000 rings, depending on the size of the shirt, which is directly proportional to the size of the person that's going to be wearing it. For somebody my size, you're looking at maybe 12 and a half to 13,000 rings, and for a larger person that's maybe 250, 6 foot, you're going to be looking at closer to that 25 or 30,000 rings, and for an exceptionally large person, you might be hitting more towards 40 to 45,000 rings. Uh, when you're wearing chainmail, one thing that you do need to consider is that you're going to need to wear a gambeson. So a gambeson is a padded, like, undercoat style garment, uh, which I'll link a, a tutorial, a uh, simple tutorial on how to make those here, that's going to pad you from the chainmail. You wear it between the chainmail and your skin. Uh, that's because chainmail tends to, to pinch a lot, it slaps when you get hit, and uh, it'll pull hair and uh, pinch your skin. and. If you don't have a shirt underneath it, it'll leave some very interesting and painful sunburns. So if you're going to do chainmail, you definitely need to get yourself or make yourself a gambeson. The tools that you're going to need for uh, making your chain are pretty simple. And really, you only need, if you're not making your rings, two things. And that's a couple of sets of pliers. Now, uh, the most common or favored type of pliers in uh, making chainmail are long, long nose or needle nose bent nose pliers. Uh, so these are spring-loaded so that you don't have to worry about constantly trying to open your pliers and the skinny uh, needle nose and bent nose really lets you get in and manipulate rings. Uh, if you're trying to work within a weave um, so you need to fix something, you can really get in there and hold on to rings uh, without the bulk of a regular pair of pliers. They just they afford you a lot more dexterity. Uh, they're usually about eight bucks for a type like this. Uh, these are smooth jawed pliers, so they won't mar uh, your the finish on your rings. So if you're using stainless steel or some sort of shiny uh, material, you're not going to be rubbing that off. Uh, or in the case of this galvanized steel, you're not ripping the the zinc coating up, which is what's going to prevent your uh, galvanized steel from rusting and getting dingy really quick. Uh, you can also use regular uh, pliers for this, uh, but as I said, they do come with a few drawbacks. Now, because they are toothed, you do hold on to rings a lot better, but you have to worry about damaging your rings. Is it going to damage them to the point where they won't be usable? Absolutely not. Will it maybe mar them up a little bit? Sure. I find them a little less easy to use, but really all that matters is what works best for you. Now, if you're going to be cutting your own rings, then you also need something to cut it with. Uh, for this, the most useful things I've found are either bolt cutters, uh, mini bolt cutters specifically, like this pair from Cobalt, or a pair of aviation snips. Either one works well for uh, cutting coil. The only addendum I'd really make to that, actually, is whatever brand of aviation snips or what quality you get really does matter. These cheap Stanley that I picked up for 14 bucks can't cut coils really at all. They're, they're pretty terrible. It requires an excessive amount of force to cut these where I can just nip away with a pair of bolt cutters. If you prefer aviation snips, I would highly recommend the uh, Craftsman uh, version of these, and I'll provide the item number for that right here. So, now that we know what tools we want to be using, uh, let's talk about the materials that we're going to use for our rings. 
So, uh, before you can really choose a metal, you need to figure out what function you want your armor to serve. Is it supposed to be functional armor in a full contact combat sport? Is it uh, supposed to be more costume armor or aesthetically appealing? Um, and you want to consider the game rules for the game that you're going to be playing in. So some metals are disallowed in certain games, uh, some games have minimum gauge requirements. So you want to make sure that you've looked into those before you start investing money. And you want to consider really what you want to get out of your armor. If you want something that's going to be hardy and is going to be, need to take a beating during a full contact game, then you're going to want to plan accordingly for that. Uh, you can check out this uh, chart right here from the Ring Lord that explains in really good detail a lot of pros and cons of a lot of different types of metal for using for chainmail, and it'll also uh, recommend a minimum gauge for armor grade uh, chainmail. Moving on from that, the next thing you need to consider once you've picked out what metal you want to use is the aspect ratio that you're going to need for the weave you want to do. So uh, aspect ratio is the relation between the diameter of your rings and the gauge of the metal that you're using. And certain types of weaves require uh, a specific range of aspect ratio. So for example, European 4 in one, which is uh, this armor here that I'm working on, requires an aspect ratio of, uh, between 4 and 6. And you can see uh, aspect ratio, uh, a good chart for that, right here, again from the Ring Lord. Uh, even if you don't intend to buy rings from them, they have a lot of really great resources, uh, such as this handy chart here for figuring out how many rings you're going to need to make a full halberd. Uh, so you need to consider uh, what weave you want to do. So if you're doing Persian 6-in-1, or King's Mail, which is uh, European 12-in-1, or the most, the easiest and most accessible and lightest uh, being the European 4-in-1, uh, what aspect ratio you're going to need. So then you find, say, you know what gauge of metal you need at a minimum, and you find, you know, where does it fall in the aspect ratio that you need to help you figure out the diameter of the rings that you need to make. Uh, once you've figured that out, uh, you can, you need to move on to uh, weave density. So if you, that, that would be how dense is your weave once it's woven. Uh, so in this, Nothing is getting through here. Uh, not even a pencil could slide through this weave. I probably didn't need to go this dense. Absolutely, actually, absolutely didn't need to. Uh, this is 14 gauge galvanized steel with 5 sixteenths uh, inner diameter rings. So I probably could have gone 6 or even 7 sixteenths and still had a weave that couldn't be punctured. So in some games, that's a necessity. Uh, so, uh, right in, in Dagger here, uh, you can't have a 1 inch rod pass through a weave. Um, in Belagarth, you can't have anything that would entangle, so you wouldn't be able to fit fingers or anything inside your weave. Uh, if you're not really certain on weave density, look around online. There's some good resources. It really all depends on the gauge, the diameter, uh, and the weave that you're going to be using. Uh, if you're not certain, get some cheaper uh, metal of the same gauge from your hardware store and get some wooden dowels. Um, and roll out some coils, uh, just like in this video up here, and um, do a few test pieces. See if it's going to make the uh, look that you want, and if it's going to pass for the game that you want it to pass for. Um, so once you figure out what metal you want to use, what ring size you need, what weave you're going to be doing, the next thing you need to figure out is, are you going to buy your rings, or are you going to make them? Um, so there's some pros and cons to both. Um, the biggest thing you have to consider is uh, the availability of materials to you, the time that you have available, and the cost of the materials. So, um, the metal that I bought, this 14 gauge galvanized steel, came from my local uh, farm supply store. It was 35 bucks for a quarter mile of it, which at this size makes about 18 to 20,000 rings. So for me, that's more than enough to make a shirt. For a larger person, uh, they might need two coils of that, so now you're getting closer to, say, $70 uh, investment in, in rings. Um, of course, that still doesn't really you know, hold a torch to buying rings, which, for a full shirt, you're looking at somewhere between $150 and $250, depending on the gauge, uh, the weave that you're doing to determine the number of rings that you need, and uh, the type of metal. So galvanized steel is going to be a lot cheaper than stainless steel by quite a bit. Um, but the next thing you need to throw in is the time. Uh, to run out all the coils and cut all of them by hand, 
is probably an additional 20 to 30 hours onto your project. When you're making a halberd uh, for a normal person, you're looking at between 30 and 50 hours just weaving it together. So um, those are the things that are really going to factor into do I want to buy my rings or do I want to make them. Um, so if you're going to be buying your rings, at this point you can go ahead and jump to the second video in the series and that's where we're going to talk about making European 4-in-1 and some tips and tricks for assembling chainmail. Uh, if you're going to be making your own rings, we have a couple of things that we still need to consider. So if you're going to be making your own rings, uh, the next thing that you need to do is get your wire and make your coils. So you can look at my video here, I'll post that, uh, link that again, uh, on how to make your own uh, coils. That'll come out just like this. Uh, once you make your coils, you have to go about cutting them, which is a bit of an art form in and of itself. So in making chainmail, we need two types of rings, open rings and closed rings. Now, for the purpose of, of making chain, uh, closed rings are not actually closed. When you clip a ring off of a coil, such as this, it's actually going to come out with about a sixteenth inch offset. So for the purpose of assembling the chain, this is going to be a closed ring, and we'll go more into that in part two of this series. And then an open ring would be a ring that actually has a gap that allows other rings to pass so that you can put rings in and weave. Uh, so you can get all of the closed rings that you need, which you will need four times as many closed rings as you will open rings, because uh, in four in one, at least, uh, four closed rings go into one open ring, and then you assemble them uh, again, which we'll cover in the second video. So you can just cut straight out of your coil like this, and then take your pair of pliers, or um, we have some other tips and tricks for this in the second video and open up every individual ring that you need. Or what you can do is uh, expand your coil like this. So all you do for this is you grab your coil, just do small sections at a time, and just tug it evenly until you have about a little more than an eighth inch gap because it is going to spring back a little bit. Uh, softer metals won't spring back so much, harder metals will spring back a lot more. And once you've expanded that about an eighth of an inch, when you cut your rings, they're going to come off the coil already open, just like that guy. So uh, a couple of things that you need to be careful with uh, when you're cutting rings like this is when you expand your coil, um, if you expand too much, you're going to make ovals instead of rings. You're going to distort your wire. And ovals don't make good four in one. They're weaker than a circular ring. They don't look very good. They're going to throw your weave off. Um, it's just not going to be very aesthetically pleasing or very functional. So you need to be careful in that. Another thing you need to be careful of is when you're cutting these, when you're cutting, say, from this end here, once you've got your. Uh, that one's somewhere. Uh, let me see. These are mine, those are Abby's, I prefer these. Um, when you've got this, you just line up on your cut, cut, and you get a perfect lined up cut every time. When you've got your expanded coil, it's a little bit more difficult, and it's easier to accidentally cut at an angle, like this. So when you do that, you end up with a ring that is far open, like this. So even when you close it, you've got a big old gap. Now you can try and work your piece of uh, chain back and forth to close that, or you can take a pair of regular pliers and gently close that, but what you're going to get out of that is an oval, uh, which again, you can use it, you don't want to use a lot of these. Um, in the grand scheme of things, if you're making 30,000 rings, 20,000 rings, throw the messed up ones in the trash. They're really not worth your hassle. But if you're careful with this, if you come in straight or at a slight inward uh, cant, you'll get nice open rings, and that'll save you a heck of a lot of time in the long run. So now that we know how to make our coils, choose our metal, and cut our rings, we're ready to move on to part two of this series, where I'm going to show you what to do with them.